I'm Christine. I am a freelance copywriter in the B2B technology space, specifically for software companies. So some of the clients I've written for are DocuSign, Thinkific, BetterUp, um, Sage, which does like accounting software. Uh, on top of my full-time freelance copywriting business, I also lead an online course. Um, I teach aspiring freelance writers how to get clients. I help writers, mostly introverted writers, understand what cold pitching is and understand some basic sales principles in order to get the freelance writing clients that lead to a lucrative writing business. So jumping in, uh, I, I want to start out with just you know, if you could share with us just like a little bit about your background story about how you built your, not only the freelance business, but maybe a little insight into how you kind of uh, pivoted into the courses and working with other freelancers and just to kind of get the, a picture of how that all developed. Yeah. So I actually started my career as a B2B salesperson selling technology and how that came about, um, I have no idea because I went to school to be an English major. And Marcus, I think I saw that you're from New York. I went to school in New York City. I went to Pace. Are you from oh, yeah. New York? Yeah, I'm from New York area. Yeah, so I'm definitely familiar with Pace. So I majored in English, but I genuinely uh, did not understand how I would make a living as a writer. And I didn't move back in with my parents when I graduated. I had a ton of student loan debt, so I needed to make money. Like I didn't have time to like get a babysitting job and figure it out later. I needed to start my career as soon as I graduated. Um, I think because I went to a business school, writing really was presented in two different ways. You were either gonna be, uh, you were gonna become an academic and get a master's degree, or you were going to go the publishing route. And those classes that you take um, in the publishing world, it was so focused on like grammar and um, comma splices. And I was like, this is so boring. I There's no way this isn't for me. So I wound up being like your typical liberal arts major when I graduated, having no idea what I wanted to do or what I could do with an English degree. And I wound up in sales. So I was wearing a headset on a sales floor, making a hundred outbound calls per day. Um, and the only thing I credit that to was I have had jobs since I was 14 years old, um, whether it was at the dollar store or the McDonald's drive through So I had customer service and people facing skills from like a lifetime of working up until that point. Um, I wound up being in sales. I hated it because I'm introverted, but I was good at it. I was good at following instructions and reading the personal development books and being coached. And so I basically stuck with this career field and it was the golden handcuffs in that sense because I was making good money. I paid off my student loan debt. I really hit so many financial goals from this sales career. And I rose through the ranks. I went from inside sales rep to managing my own territory, traveling throughout the US. I became an outside sales rep, managing my own territory. And I was making six figures by 27 years old. So it enabled so much for me, but I knew the whole time that it was an uphill battle and it didn't sit right with who I was. It was such a struggle, right? Because there's some salespeople out there who are super like natural at it and they thrive and they're extroverted. And then there was the sales rep like me who I was hitting my numbers and I was an asset to the team, but it was because I had to work so much harder. It was such a struggle. So basically at the epitome or the peak of my sales career, I just burnt out and I snapped and I quit with no backup plan. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, but I can't keep doing this. So I literally quit. Um, and then of course I do what a lot of people do at that point. You're on the Google and you're saying work from home jobs jobs that don't require a boss. I like writing. What do I do with my life? So I wound up discovering freelance copywriting and 
I had worked with the marketing department pretty closely because that most of the sales jobs were in startups, but it never really occurred to me that like, oh, this is a functioning of marketing. A specific copywriter sits there and creates the messages. The experience I did have with copywriting to that point though was emailing, cold emailing specifically. So as a full cycle sales rep, I was always booking my own meetings. I was playing with subject lines to see what would get me into the door with that CEO, what would book that meeting. And that was really where I thrived, was getting my foot in the door cold. Was I the closer? Not necessarily, but I knew that was where I excelled. And now, nowadays, sales functions are broken out where they have like a whole, it's like BDR, SDR, you know, that there's someone who's actually responsible for opening the door. I was really that was my, I guess, my strength. So once I learned about freelance copywriting, I was like, okay, yeah, I used to book my own meetings with those emails. I understand how to write and I do have the writing background. Let me parlay this into this whole freelance copywriting thing. And it just literally went from, I'm going to create my own website. I'm going to change my LinkedIn profile and I'm going to do what I have been trained to do for the past six or seven years, which is cold outreach. I started reaching out to tech clients saying, I'm a freelance copywriter. I felt like a total fraud because I had never done it. But I said, you know, I was your target audience. I used to use a CRM every day. I used to use sales technology and I can write for your target audience if you'll give me the chance. And within four months, I had been, I essentially started making a full-time income as a freelance copywriter. So what happened next was that this trajectory that I took from being unemployed to full-time freelancer in as little as four months, I realized that not all copywriters were doing that. If anything, people wanted to become freelance copywriters, but had no idea what to do. They were going on Fiverr and Upwork and writing for a penny, a word or whatever they offer. Um, They were begging for opportunities in Facebook groups. It never occurred to me that the ladder that I climbed was really not accessible to most people because who has a sales background as a writer? Not many people. So I created my online course. It's called 30 Days to Paid. And it basically teaches you the exact steps I took to go from unemployed, no prior professional copywriting experience to landing your first high paying client in 30 days. And I teach aspiring writers, introverted writers, how to get on that platform and cold pitch and get your first writing client and parlay it into a full-time freelance career the exact same way that I did. I there's so many things that you were just talking about that I'm like nodding my head furiously here. Um, first of all, you you really, the fact that you had that selling background is something that I totally agree with you as far as what I've seen, not as prevalent in the freelance world, right? People relying on think, you know, platforms like Fiverr or whatever, which I've never done. So I'm not very familiar with how that works, how it works, but I understand it's not necessarily as lucrative as one might hope, but you know, who knows? The point is, is that there are very few people who actually feel comfortable with selling, right? In that role. And that that's really uh, something that I actually had a similar situation with. I didn't work professionally in that sense uh, for years in the sales role, but I did the same thing pretty much when I started, or I did both, right? So I, I, For years as a freelance copywriter, tried to rely on LinkedIn or try to rely on inbound or whatever it was, and then realized that I just need to start calling. I need to start emailing. I need to actually connect with people and create conversations. So I love that that's your focus with this course too, because um, a lot of, you know, courses like, like freelance courses and things that I've seen have to do with like just inbound how to optimize your profile and have, you know, the quote clients speeding at your door and can't, you know, and that's great. But ultimately in my personal experience, like being able to just have a very targeted list of potential prospects, very, uh, you know, having a very intentional focus and using the CRM, like the fact that you had that experience, right. 
Um, so I just want to kind of throw that out there, that that's something that I've not seen very often that people are approaching it that way. And I'm 100% in agreement with you about the importance of that. Well, yeah, on the topic of the CRM, that's something that I teach in my course too, is like the concept of a pipeline, of a client pipeline. And I totally agree with what you said, that relying on inbound and referrals, it's great, but it's the long game. If you want to start making money right now, you have access to it. You just have to send a cold email or a cold message. Having people passively engage with your thought leadership content on LinkedIn is great, but that's not going to get you paid like this month. It's not going to open the door to a sales call right now. Cold emailing has that power, but you know, the average freelance writer doesn't have that vernacular. What is a pipeline? Well, a pipeline just means that if I send 30 cold messages to my ideal, you know, bucket list clients and a certain percentage of them answer, then a certain percentage of them will convert to a paying client. And when you can actually organize your outreach to say, this person answered, I got on a call with this guy. And then now I'm in the proposal stage with this client, you can visually see how close you are to reaching your freelance income goal. But not many people think like that. They just think, oh, um, you know, this month might be a good month. Next month, I might have nothing. So there is a way to stabilize the uncertainty of freelance income a little bit if you go at it in like a, I guess, from a salesperson's perspective. And it's it's also so much more empowering to know that you have not control over the outcome, in my opinion, right? I mean, you can't you can't know for sure who's going to become a client, but control over your actions. And I, I've talked about this quite often that I've, for the longest time, had had a debilitating fear of rejection, including cold outreach, particularly cold calling and cold outreach, right? So I'm somebody who did it in spite of having like just severe anxiety overdoing it. So I understand that discomfort, right? And, um, you know, but when you're trying to start any kind of business and relying on what you mentioned earlier about thought leadership, those are all nice things to build on. And you want to have that as part of it, right? So my attitude toward LinkedIn, I don't know if you feel the same way or similarly, you know, um, if, if a prospect that I reach out to, like, let's say for now, like with the coaching, right? They go to my LinkedIn, if they see what I'm sharing on LinkedIn, that's going to help them get a deeper understanding about where I'm coming from, what my perspective is, what I might know or not know, all those things. But it's not necessarily the LinkedIn post that made them go, wow, this dude is brilliant. Like, you know, that's not my expectation with it, right? So, you know, being able to approach it where, yes, you're putting out, you don't want your LinkedIn to be barren, right? Because I remember years ago, um, or last year, I should say, you know, looking for freelance writers for an agency and, you know, really having a hard time finding somebody good, partly because they were like, it was like a ghost town as far as understanding what set them apart. So it really is kind of having both, right? For sure. You definitely want to be putting out something that showcases your expertise. And that's why I like LinkedIn though. You can just put your writing samples directly on your profile. You could link out to your website. There's, it's basically like a walking portfolio. And I always say this, and I teach this in my course. The reason why I actually suggest LinkedIn cold messaging versus cold emailing is that a cold email is a wall of text basically. Whereas LinkedIn, it's a lot more personal. They can see your photo. They have instant access to your profile. So it's a form of social selling that is a lot more compelling and builds trust a lot more easily versus a cold email. That's a really good point. I tend to use both. Like I, I, I like to think of it as like, you know, uh, email is one good channel. If I can find the right email address, of course, and LinkedIn is maybe, you know, sometimes my second follow-up attempt thing. So I, you know, for me, I've, I've used both and uh, with mixed results for both sides. Some people prefer LinkedIn, right? They never, they don't check their email, respond on email the same way. Some people never check LinkedIn, right? So you could send them something and, you know, <laughs> two months later when they sign in, they're like, oh, wow, I got this email. Oh, well, or this message. Um, I wanted to go back to what you mentioned earlier when you were, you know, in this sales role 
and you mentioned that, you know, as an introvert, it wasn't necessarily very comfortable for you, right? Which, which I can relate to as far as being an introvert. And um, can you, you know, share a little bit about like, what was it in particular that was challenging about that for you, both as a salesperson, but then even as you started to build your own business, like the emotional part or fear, whatever it is that it might've been, uh, and and kind of maybe some ideas of how other people can approach that part, because it's not just the technical, how do you reach out to people and build a pipeline? It's also a lot of like, you know, kind of uh, resistance that people have emotionally. Yeah. So I would say, okay, so something I always say in my marketing is like, if I can do this, you can too, which is true, but the unfair advantage that I do do have is being a trained salesperson. And the benefit of that is that once all those emotions start kicking in and telling you, do not reach out to that person, that person already told you not to talk to them. And now you're going to reach out again. All the emotions that start flaring up, you don't have the option of giving into the emotion because you have a manager over your head saying you better reach back out to that person. So that's something I really teach is to actually pretend that you do have a micromanager over your shoulder and not give into the emotion and do what needs to be done. I want people to remove the emotion from cold outreach. So when I was in sales, um, I would get cursed off, hung up on, it was like terrifying. And I was selling to small businesses. A lot of them were really like, I don't know what the word, I, it's not gruff. They're very like, um, you know, they're not, I guess like now calling on B2B marketers and the enterprise, they're, they're pretty buttoned up. They understand professionalism, but when you're yeah. calling on small businesses, it's like Joe's pizza. And if you catch him while he's in the middle of like checking someone out, he's going to curse you off and tell you'd never come back. So like, I've been through a lot of, I used to have to go into buildings. I was kicked out of buildings. So nothing can be really worse than that. What we do as freelance copiers, you have to keep this in perspective. You're not a multi-level marketer selling like um, Herbalife or like knives, right? You're not going door to door and you're not recruiting people into a pyramid scheme. You're not that. You're not a telemarketer because I'll, I'll never forget when I got my sales job right out of school, my dad didn't understand like what B2B sales like was. And he was like, oh, I, I'm really mean to telemarketers. I feel so bad now that you're doing that. Like I pro I'll probably stop. I'm like, I'm not a telemarketer. I'm a salesperson. But it, it's that same um, fear is like, we don't want to come across as telemarketers. We don't want to be rejected, but you have to understand what you're doing and the larger picture of cold outreach, right? Because number one, LinkedIn is a business focused platform. So you have every right to go on there and cold pitch people. Doesn't mean they're going to like it. Doesn't mean they're going to respond to you. Most likely for our case with freelancing and you know businesses, they're not going to curse you off. They're going to have some decorum when it comes to that. The most I've ever gotten was like not interested. So there's really not that much you can lose. No one's really going to bug out on you. Um, you're not really, I guess, it's not Facebook. It's not Instagram. You're not sliding in someone's DMs. You are literally a service provider letting it be known that you're providing a business service that they could potentially need. Most of the time, clients respond, meaning the ones that do respond, the majority of them actually thank me for reaching out to them. And the reason being is that searching for a writer or searching for any service-based business, whether it's a photographer, graphic designer, is hard. It is difficult. You are sorting through portfolios, clicking on websites, trying to judge. You're trying to get proposals, get pricing. You know, Marcus, I mean, you hired writers. I have also hired teams of writers as well. It's, it's a lot hard. of work. Yeah. It's very hard so, to find. Yeah. So if the right writer pops into your inbox at the exact moment that you needed them, that's the response I get. Thank you so much. We were looking for that. And I was dreading this process. So when you just logically break down what you're doing in cold outreach and understand that you're not annoying, understand that you're not out of, uh, that you're not out of integrity, that you're not doing anything wrong. It takes away some of that fear of rejection and that emotion. And at the end of the day, we all are doing a job. We have a livelihood. We have to feed ourselves. So 
I think everyone can understand that, yes, maybe they don't want to be cold pitched, but everyone's just doing their job. You got to do it. You got to send the message. You got to post the uncomfortable post. You just have to push yourself. Absolutely. And what you mentioned about the the timing aspect, that was my experience as well when I was doing the outreach for uh, particularly for, you know, B, B2B as well, freelance clients. Um, I remember a few years ago when I was focusing on the uh, SaaS space, like so many people do, right? B2B SaaS. And, you know, I wasn't, this is my perspective and tell me if you disagree, but, you know, I'm not going to convince a, a, a CMO or a director of marketing that they need a copywriter. Like that wasn't my job because they either do or they don't. Um, different than if you were maybe working with or wanted to work with a very small business owner, right? Who's like, you know, they don't know maybe as much about it. But when you're talking about agencies or larger companies, they get it. Like they know what the roles are. They know what a copywriter is. My role that I figured out very quickly was the timing, right? They either need somebody right now or they don't, or they might need somebody soon. And then they, you know, some people, they just keep all the emails. They just kind of hang on. They have a little swipe file of potential contractors. Um, but it's, I, I think that took off so much pressure because I didn't need to figure out how to spin anything into like convincing somebody of anything. The only thing I needed to do was make sure that it was targeted and personalized and was relevant to them as much as possible but also just like the timing was completely out of my control. The part that also really helped me, and uh, I really started thinking about this a lot more very recently is, is as far as the the emotional hangups I might have had about outreach or selling in general. And I've been selling, you know, in some form or another, you know, my entire adult life, right? And I've had those selling knives moments with Cutco back in the day, right? And I sold insurance to business to business in Manhattan in like the nineties when Manhattan was still like, you know, so there's like, um, I've had, I've experienced all levels of it. Right. So one thing that I've been really focusing on a lot for myself recently is the, the idea of what you said too, about integrity and authenticity. And I realized that the more I was trying to sound or appear like somebody else or that they this is the way you should write something or this is how to draft a, uh, you know, a, a headline or a, a subject line and an email to grab people's attention. For me personally, as a writer, somebody who can play around with different ideas and come up with something that's just my own was not only much more comfortable to saying, you know what, I understand the principles of selling. I'm still going to follow those principles. And, and, you know, I encourage everybody listening to understand the principles of influence. You know, you don't want to just wing it. But combining those principles with your authentic voice, being real with people, right? And not thinking that you have to come up with some magic combination of words that's going to like, mesmerize a prospect into compliance. Like A, that's probably not going to happen. B, that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on you to try to, you know, and and for a lot of people, it just doesn't feel right. So, yeah, I don't know, you know, what, what, if that's something that you've come across for your own work or what you do with, with your, your students for the course, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about how kind of you approach that as well. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying. It's, it's not this magic combination of the exact words. And I sell a template pack um, that teaches freelancers everything from cold outreach to onboarding a client to all of the client situations that come up like, oh, uh, they, you know, how do I raise my prices? How do I ask for more? How do I ask for more work? How do I ask for a referral? How do I push back on this? Right. So I provide the templates and I, you know, explain how the templates work and why they're effective. But I encourage every freelancer to change the language to be more suitable to your personality or else it's just going to come across as not authentic. And you don't want a bunch of robotic people sending the same cold outreach message because that's just what gives cold outreach such a bad name. Um, so you have to understand the principles of what makes somebody open an email and respond to it, but you have to use your own tone. 
Um, so like, for example, I've gotten a lot of templates over the years to deal with certain freelance client situations, like let's say uh, unpaid invoices. Well, if you read a, a template for unpaid invoices, it, it they usually sound very direct, very terse, very, um, you know, to the point, but that doesn't take into account this the relationship that I have with my client and I want to keep working with my client. So I'm going to take that template and I'm going to soften it and say, you know, add the pleasantries and the pleases and the thanks and advances and make it a little bit more, you know, according to the tone for my situation versus you need to pay me right now. Please send receipt of payment at yeah. this time. So it comes off well, right? Right. So yeah. you have to, I think anyone using templates really needs to be aware of tone and infusing your own personality and not saying things that you would not say out loud. Yeah. And we see that, you know, as far as uh, we see unintentional templates, right? So most of us are the recipients of some kind of email outreach. We certainly go on websites and we see what, what is considered kind of the default or the status quo when it comes to marketing writing. You know, I see this a lot with companies. They're not necessarily thinking about what is our own unique perspective on this. They're kind of like looking at it and going like, how do we, you know, how do we be businessy, right? How do we sound corporate and important? Like, so even as a, as a freelancer with your own business, if you're looking at the, the emails coming into your inbox for examples of what the right thing to do is, because these are professional salespeople, so they must know something First of all, realize that's not always the case, right? You know, there's a lot of sales organizations organizations out there that are churning out just the most, you know, generic spammy stuff you'll ever see. What you can do from those though is start to kind of reverse engineer the thinking behind it. So you see if you find an email or somebody sends you an email that you really go like, wow, you know, I might not really need what they have, but I like their approach with this. Look at that reverse engineer. What did they do here? Not how did they write it? Not what words that they use specifically, but why did they approach it this way? How did they start it? Right. So you can learn not only that in a way that's going to help you with your own uh, marketing and outreach as well, but as a marketing copywriter, if that's your gig, it's only going to make you that much stronger a writer, right? Because a lot of people are starting this as English majors or writers or journalists background, but they're not necessarily really educated and experienced on what makes something a marketing or selling message versus a, you know, an editorial piece, for example. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, what you're talking about, it's called a swipe file and every copywriter and marketer has one. It's that post that makes you stop scrolling. It's that email that just like, wow, that was a really good email and you save it. And everyone should be deconstructing those emails and asking themselves, why did this work? Cause it's like you, it, the, the thing that made you stop scrolling and the thing that made you click the email happens on such a subconscious level and it's such a gut reaction. So that's why copywriting and marketing speaks to a lot of like our base desires and something happens on a deep psychological level, what prompts us to open something and be curious. So you have to stop and say, wait, 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 before I keep scrolling on, I have to actually examine why that post made me stop. What about it made me stop? And if you can continue to do that, uh, you will improve, right? Because like you said, a lot of writers don't have a persuasion or sales background. And that's why on my YouTube channel and whenever I'm talking to a new copywriter, the first thing they always ask is what books and courses should I take? And I always say, read books on marketing and sales first, understand like the entire, like understand the business ecosystem and what your ultimate goal is, because it's really not oh, just being a good writer. It's sales, it's persuasion, it's conversions. So if you understand what your goal is as a copywriter and what you're trying to get the customer to do, you will write good copy as a result of that. It's really not about getting the punctuation and the grammar perfect. And it's also really kind of, if you think about the one of the meta skills of selling and marketing, which I, I agree with you completely. In fact, I'd say I've learned more about marketing 
from a, from sales books than I ever learned from marketing books, right? Especially copywriting books. There's a lot of copywriting books that in my opinion are just very like, you know, formulatic and here's how to like, you know, like the word something again, kind of like tricks. And I'm not a tricks person. I've never wanted to be a tricks person, but I really kind of think of a meta, meta skill in business in general, but sales and marketing in particular is empathy. And I don't mean like the empathy when you think about like the kind of empathy that can actually hold us back where, oh, I don't want to be a nuisance. I don't want to be a pest. I don't want to bother them. But the kind of empathy is of realizing that people have problems that they need solutions to, right? So if you're hiring, you know, or last year, you know, if I'm, I'm looking for copywriters for an agency, right? I have a problem. I want to find somebody really good that's going to have a specific type of not even experience, but it's, you know, a certain style that I feel is like, oh, this person kind of gets it. It's a, a good human style. They write well. And how do they think? Oh, they, they're good thinkers. I want to understand how they approach problems. If somebody were to email me out of nowhere with something that relates to that problem, I'm going to read the email, right? And if it's written in a personable way, if it's feels authentic, if it's not too pushy, if it's, it doesn't make certain mistakes that people make with, with selling outreach or, or marketing where they just talk to somebody like they're an object, all those things. Yes, of course, I'm going to talk to that person. And I'm not going to have resistance to doing that because they're pitching me. I'm going to be like, oh, this is a potential solution to my problem. So starting out with, if you're a copywriter or any other type of creative freelancer, whatever it is you do, you start to get very comfortable with the notion that you serve a function that solves problems for certain types of people. And if you could start with narrowing down who those people are and understanding how they perceive that problem and then how to position yourself as a potential solution, not the solution or I'm the greatest or you won't need anybody, but a potential solution. Because at the end of the day, all you're trying to do is initiate a conversation right? Because they're not going to hire you from an email, right? You're trying to initiate a conversation. That's it. No, and I agree with your last uh, statement too. And that's the biggest misconception that writers and freelancers and service-based business owners have when it comes to getting clients and selling is that they're really nervous about hopping on those client calls, thinking they're going to have to close them, right? And luckily, and I can say this as someone who is in sales, there's no closing technique really. Um, because at least for me with, with my niche and probably you too, Marcus, it's not, um, Hey, give me your credit card number by the end of this phone call. It's a, it's an enterprise, you know, decision that requires multiple stakeholders and approvals and they're going to get back to you and they're not going to make, you know, they'll be sold on you in that call, but you have to sign contracts. And it's like a more of a lengthy um, purchasing decision. So I just like to reiterate that because when I say to new freelancers, you have to get on client calls, they think, oh, I have to get on a sales call. It's not a sales call. It's a what we call discovery call in sales, where you're discovering what they need and whether or not you even want to take them on as a client. You're, it's a vibe check. You're discovering whether or not you're a good fit for one another. And through a natural conversation, both parties should understand whether it's going to be a good fit. It's more about asking questions than selling. There's no really selling other than the initial elevator pitch where you introduce yourself and talk about your background, you know? So that's a lot of the the coaching I do in my program, at least is like taking the, the expectation and the pressure out of those sales calls. And even the elevator pitch at the beginning, I don't even, in, in, in most cases, that doesn't even happen in the beginning of my conversations at all. First of all, they can find that on your website and your LinkedIn, they get it, you're a copywriter, whatever you do. Um, even when, when potential clients have been like, tell me a little bit about yourself. It's almost like the beauty test, you know, like, oh, it impressed me. A lot of times I'll kind of reverse it a little bit intentionally because I know that's not actually what they want and it's not going to help because there's a lot of things I've done and there's a lot of ways I approach my business and work that might be useful to them. But unless I understand what it is they're challenged with, I won't know what to focus on. So a lot of times, even if that's invited at the beginning, I might give like, well, I've been doing this for this long, blah, blah, blah. 
Now, you know, in order for me to have a better idea of like where where to focus and what might be most useful to you, I'd like to learn a little bit more, blah, 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 right? So that's a very, that's a, it seems like that's kind of a tactic, but it's, or a technique. It's not, it's, it's authentically, I want to understand what the problem is. And I don't know if you can relate to this, but my favorite, you know, uh, initial discovery calls or onboarding calls with clients or whatever we want to call it are the ones where like, I literally ask just a cure, authentically curious, open-ended question at the beginning and spend the next 45 minutes listening and writing notes. And I don't know if you've seen this, but you might be surprised people listening, how often that happens, right? Because if you're just like, if you're again, empathy and authenticity, really curious to understand what it is they're challenged with, they will let you know, right? And it takes all the burden off you because then your job really is to understand that, to ask good questions, to follow up, to, to get, to explore, you know, maybe get a little bit more detail about specific things that they bring up. But then really just kind of understand, okay, this is the thing they're looking for. Like, how do I give that to them? And if you present that to them in a in a clear way, maybe you won't be the one they hire. But I think in most cases, you might find out that you're gonna you're gonna actually uh, land a lot more of those projects. Yeah, and I think that's the the introvert advantage and the empathetic person's advantage is that we are deep listeners. I think a lot of writers tend to be introverted, more analytical thinkers. And that's what's such a shame about this fear about getting clients is that, you know, they think, oh, I need to be Mr. Outgoing, Mr. Used Car Salesman. But like you said, if you can actually be that person that is a active, deep listener, you set yourself aside from so many people because I don't know if you've noticed this, Marcus, but I can't get on a call these days without somebody checking Slack text messaging and their eyes darting around the screen every five minutes. We have become just so distracted. It's normalized to have a short attention span now. Zoom has made it somehow acceptable to completely, I guess, you know, divert your attention in the middle of someone speaking. And those things are really big red flags when you're trying to make a good first impression on someone. So if you can just sit there and actually hold eye contact and listen deeply and show that you've been listening based on your responses, you're going to get the clients that just want to seemingly vomit all of their problems on you because they're like, oh, someone finally you know, has an attention span, can understand what my business problems are, and will hopefully come up with a solution. Absolutely. Like deep listening, uh, the ability to focus and be 100% present and really, really listen is like a superpower. Yeah. It is a superpower because A, to your point, everybody's just bouncing around. Oh, you know, you see them and they think they're all like, you know, they think they're all slick that you can't tell that they're doing this exactly. all the time, right? Yep. <laughs> But also think about it on a personal level, right? So what what is selling really about? Selling is is an emotion thing. It's not just information transfer. It's an emotional feeling. So how does do they feel like they're seen? Do they feel like they're like somebody cares for real? Again, authenticity, empathy. And how often as individuals do we actually have somebody who really listens to us that we're not paying per hour for, for, you know, for therapy or whatever. And even then they're probably like, you know, dozing off behind you on the couch, but like how often it's not very common. So if you can be that person, instead of being the person that feels like you have to impress them and you have to tell them how passionate you are about whatever, like, that's fine. Be passionate, but that's not what is going to make the difference or you know all your bullet point lists about how much experience you have there's a time and place for that so if somebody says well you know turns out we have a couple of people we're looking at and our main thing is we really want to make sure we have somebody with a lot of experience in this area that's a great reason to actually mention specific things like that right or the last copy writer we had we felt like made these mistakes and we want you know, you can bring all those things up, but you don't have to put the pressure on yourself at the beginning of a conversation to just vomit 
everything about yourself and how awesome you are because a it's not what they're there to learn and b that's what everybody else says anyway you know right. portfolios are great have a portfolio make it the best you can but don't be surprised if it's not the portfolio that gets you the job the portfolio is almost like oh yeah i see you. okay cool you know <laughs> like do they have stuff there um so in, in a way, it's like selling in an authentic way and selling well is a lot easier than a lot of people think it is because they're seeing examples of the worst of its practitioners, right? You're getting emails, spammy emails from the worst of its practitioners. You're, ha you're on discovery calls for software salespeople that are not necessarily coming at it from a way that's as effective because they're under, as you said, a tremendous pressure. When you have to send, when you have to make a hundred phone calls a day, you're going to have to cut corners, right? Unless you have all the information laid out for you on Salesforce, right? So it's understandable, but you as a sale, as a, a freelancer, you don't have that. You have pressure. You want to make sure you hit your own kind of targets, but you can, you can take your time and, and make sure you're doing it right. Yeah. I, personalize my pitches to an extent. I mean, it needs to be scalable because I, you know, pitching is about numbers a lot of the time, but I never send a generic message to any prospective client because it's very easy, especially on a platform like LinkedIn to gather something personal about them and throw it in that message. And unfortunately, even that now has gotten a little bit um, outplayed, overplayed, because uh, people will just include something so generic, right? Like, oh, I see you are this. Love your profile. And it's like, okay. You I see you're on LinkedIn and you are a human. <laughs> you yeah. breathe air and I do too. So I thought I'd send this connection. So yeah. 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 Um, well, let's, let's let, and, and I want to, I want to, this is a good opportunity to kind of like, as we wrap up to talk about that, because personalization is something that can be very easily misunderstood. Right. So to your point, if you're just looking for something like, I see you live on the East Coast. I also live on the East Coast. We should talk. You know, that's pointless because all it is is just basically you're trying to get credit for like the fact that you took the time to look at their profile. And that again is not the point. It's not that people like it's still spammy. They're still going to feel it's not relevant. Relevance isn't just, you know, some kind of like a little factoid that just demonstrates you looked at their website. Relevance is you saw something about them, their business, their circumstance, a trigger event, whatever, that is the reason that you're reaching out to them. So in a perfect world, you know, if, if you know, this is, I don't see this happening, but, you know, a perfect world, a CMO that you're actually want to connect with hosts on LinkedIn, you know, we just lost our copywriter. You know, it's kind of a silly example, but, you know, does anybody know anybody? now that's your perfect in, right? I saw on LinkedIn that you're looking for this kind of person. I saw the last person there, special, you know, it's about relevance, their problem. And if you can do that, that's real personalization, not just the fact that there's like their name is inserted in the beginning of the email or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's mentioning something that you observed, but tying it back to what you offer and why you're reaching out. So even what you mentioned about this perfect scenario with a CMO mentioning we lost our copywriter. It's funny because one of my longest standing clients I got because on LinkedIn, somebody in the marketing department made a post saying we're hiring for X, Y, and Z marketing roles and listed them out. Um, I happened to be connected with them and I messaged them saying, Hey, I saw that you're expanding the marketing department. I saw you were hiring for these roles. I know you didn't list copywriter on that list, but in case you need someone for blah, blah, blah project, I would love to be considered. And that actually wound up becoming a long-term, long-term client. So I would just say with personalization, um, the more you can understand somebody's overall strategy and what they're trying to achieve with their marketing goal, the more accurate your pitch will be. If I see that a client is producing webinars consistently and they're promoting them, I could say, listen, something I specialize in is taking webinars and converting them into blog posts. And I see that you're putting out these webinars consistently. So understand how the client is trying to drive leads, understand what their goals are as a marketer and try to 
wedge yourself into their goal. And that's what makes a, a pitch effective. I could not agree more. That's a great place to to start wrapping up. I, I, I love everything you were saying. And I think, again, it's something that uh, I've not seen um, really talked about as much as it should be when it comes to freelancers and building a creative freelance business. And uh, I want to give you a chance to share with everybody. It's all, I'm going to include it in the, the links in the notes as well, of course, but just tell everybody where they can find you and learn more about, uh, especially this course. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. So if you're looking for a B2B copywriter specifically for software, christinegamoka.com, it's just my name.com. But if you are interested in freelance writing tips, content writing tips, um, content marketing, uh, visit paidcopywriter.com. I have a free guide you can download on how to get on LinkedIn and start cold pitching. It's completely free. It tells a little bit about my story that I mentioned before of how I transitioned from unemployed to full-time freelancer. And I teach other writers, other aspiring freelancers, how they can optimize their profile and start you know, setting yourself up so that when you do send that cold pitch, your profile and your website are all set up and they, you know, that prospective client can see what they need to see from you in order to answer your cold pitch. So paidcopywriter.com is where you can find all that good information and YouTube and my podcast, the paid copywriter podcast and the paid copywriter YouTube channel is usually how people find me. So check that out as well.